Well, hello, um, I'm Sarah Rooney. I am the executive director of the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. Um, and I want to welcome you to our forum, co-hosted by ICPR and the League of Women Voters. Um, today we are talking about um, integrity and accountability in the 2018 elections. And I'm really excited to share this wonderful lineup of officials and advocates here um, to talk with us today. So we're really going to be discussing a timely and relevant topic. After I realized how many election questions I was getting um, a year out from the general election, I thought, let's just get each other in a room and just kind of hammer it all out at once. I think that it'll be really helpful. Um, they're here to answer your questions. We're going to go through some of the questions as a discussion point that we think are very important, but we're going to open it up at the end to an audience Q&A, and we'll take some from our live stream as well um, to make sure that we get all of our questions answered today. So our, our moderator, Ami Gandhi, is no stranger to election administration and advocacy. Her organization, the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, has been active in various voting rights campaigns for many years in Illinois. Um, and they've also worked with professionals on the ground at polling places on election day to collect data and make sure that voters have the best experience possible. Um, so I'll let you tell, uh, I'll let her tell you more about her work in a minute, um, as well as our intrepid panelists. Um, so at the end of our event, our panelists will be available for Q&A, so be thinking about your questions as we go. And um, if there's any League members here today, we want to say thank you so much for coming. And ICPR supporters, we want to say thank you as well. Uh, we'll be live streaming today's discussion on our Facebook page. That's uh, Facebook at the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. And we'll be tweeting at IL Campaign and at LWVIL, League of Women Voters Illinois, and you can use the hashtag ILElections18 to make sure we see your tweets and your questions. And you'll find um, event evaluation cards in your program. It's really helpful for us if you fill those out and let us know what you think, um, just to give us some feedback and make sure that all of our future events are as perfect as possible. So without further ado, I want to invite Ami Gandhi to start our program. Thank you so much. Sarah, and thank you so much to all of you for being here today, especially our respected panelists. As Sarah mentioned, I'm Ami Gandhi, and I'm with Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and I wanted to share with you a sampling of some of the topics that we will be discussing in today's program. We will hear from the experts about issues like security and security threats in Illinois, voting machines and ballot security, election day worker training and recruitment, early voting, election day registration, automatic voter registration, and oversight and accountability measures for election processes. The, I know I threw out a whole lot of terms just now, and the, I wanted to say also that the real life impact of these processes and of election administration really cannot be overstated. For a lot of voters, it can make the difference between whether we have the ability to vote or not. And the national context is that in recent years there has been a resurgence of restrictive voting laws across the country, some of them coming after the 2013 Supreme Court decision that gutted the Voting Rights Act, some of the voting restrictions coming with the changes in Department of Justice enforcement in this current presidential administration, some of the national conversations about whether uh, what the incidence is of voter fraud, for example, and the establishment of the Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity, just to name a few of the recent developments that have changed the voting landscape across the country. I don't mean to paint an overly dismal picture, though, because when election administration works well and it's fair, it can really be an immense opportunity for our communities for people to have a voice who were previously either purposely or in a more subtle way excluded from our voting systems in the past, such as communities of color, low-income communities, voters with disabilities, new citizens, citizens who are in the re-entry process after incarceration, and other disenfranchised groups as well. We ourselves, as a nonprofit, nonpartisan legal organization, get numerous calls and reports, especially around election time, of various types of barriers that and election administration questions and problems that voters face at the polls and trying to register or trying to vote, 
And we're proud to say that many of the problems in Illinois, our work is Illinois focused, and many of the problems in Illinois are solvable, especially in collaboration with election officials and experts, and many of the problems are preventable too. We certainly have hope and we see many good practices and even more uh, practices and policies on the horizon here in Illinois to improve our voting systems. You all have heard how automatic voter registration was recently signed into law and some great minds in election administration are already thinking hard and working hard about how to make that program a reality and to implement it really well. And there are some excellent practices in place in various parts of Illinois in terms of really hearing and incorporating input from voters, from all of us voters, whether it's managing the flow of voters who need to update their registration ahead of time or at the polls, language access to the polls in some parts of the state, guarding against electioneering and so on. We have some really um, solid practices in place in parts of Illinois where election authorities are taking seriously the concerns of voters. So with that, I, we want to spend most of our time really hearing from the experts here. And I want to ask each panelist to introduce yourself briefly, say, please share your name and your institution and um, anything else to set up your remarks. Keep it to about a minute, please. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I've never kept anything to a minute. <laughs> but uh, first off, I want to thank Sarah Bruni. She puts together this event uh, really exceptionally well. We're glad to partner with her and host this room, using this room that we've used so many times for early voting and hearings and all kinds of different functions, vote by mail processing, and also to Amit Gandhi for moderating. Uh, I've been very fortunate through my life to have uh, several vantage points around elections. Uh, uh, my mom was with the League of Women Voters uh, and, and the secretary of, the, of her local organization. Um, it was at the dinner table every night we talked about politics. Uh, I got to cover elections as a journalist and, uh, and then also saw it from the vantage point of a campaign in between journalism and this uh, chapter of my life and finally as an election administrator and most recently as a, as a judge of election, I wanted to see exactly how it was to be where the rubber meets the road. So uh, thank you for joining us all. Oh, I'm Jim Allen. <laughs> I serve as a communications director with the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago. Hi, I'm Bernadette Matthews. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at the State Board of Elections. Uh, before moving into this position, I was the Deputy General Counsel for the Board. Working for the State Board of Elections, I typically communicate with a lot of election authorities and governmental entities, so I don't always get the opportunity to uh, be present in this type of forum and interact with all of you, so I'm grateful for that opportunity today. Thank you all. My name is Scott Erickson. I'm the Knox County Clerk from Galesburg, Illinois. I also am uh, honored to be the president of the Illinois County Clerks and Quarters Association this year. So I represent um, and to speak for uh, all my constituents and uh, my colleagues that work and run the, in the election world. Um, politics has always been an important thing to me. My father was a history teacher in the junior high level for 42 years. So I had a similar story every night around the, uh, the dinner table. We talked about the topics of the day. We talked about the importance of making sure that you get out and vote and become educated and smart about the candidates you are voting for. So I, that was instilled in me at a young age, and I've worked to instill it in my children at a young age and hope that uh, we're able to continue on and be able to expand that, uh, that knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Noah Prates. I'm the Director of Elections for the Cook County Clerk's Office. I work for David Orr, the Cook County Clerk. Um, I think I've been destined uh, or condemned, depending on the day, uh, to do this job from the very beginning. Uh, in 1963, my parents met in Selma, Alabama, um, on the 3rd March. In 1964, my father went to Mississippi to do Mississippi Freedom Summer. Um, I started doing this work uh, a year out of college, 12 jobs later, right, from getting my degree. I took a temporary job. Uh, typing in voter registration cards, and uh, after the election, listening to Bush v. Gore while canvassing the elections, 
or I knew that sort of I landed on uh, probably what, what I was asking to do, at least till now. Um, <laughs> I, and I say this in fairness, 2000 was an inflection point in elections. We remember that, that election and swept the whole new uh, crop of voting equipment. So elections wasn't logistics, just logistics. It then became information technology and a new sort of, kind of set of skills were needed to run an office. Well, I think 2016 was an inflection point as well. And so as we're logistics managers and IT managers, and now we also need to bring in a set of skills to manage information security. Um, and so, so make no mistake, we're in a brand new threat environment. As such, in the clerk's office, we kind of refocus our efforts into the, the following creed, defend, detect, and recover. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that today. So thanks for coming out. Hello, thank you for, thank you everyone for coming out today. And thank you, Ami, for moderating. Um, my name is Colin Williams. I'm the policy director for the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. So I help uh, ICPR do research on policy and identify key aspects of our elections administration that um, are important and may be overlooked um, in making uh, elections secure and accessible for the voters of Illinois. Um, and as uh, in my role uh, in ICPR, uh, I really look forward to and embrace any opportunity that uh, we get to uh, collaborate with election administrators like we have on our panel today and voter advocates um, like Ami. And so uh, I'm happy to be here uh, talking about election administration from the point of um, ICPR and trying to um, figure out what the best practices are to make sure that everyone who is eligible to vote is able to vote um, in 2018 and beyond. Thank you, everyone. We have a lot of exciting questions for today, so I'm going to ask if one or two panelists want to respond to each question that would be helpful to get us going. And let's keep it conversational, and please jump in when you would like to say something. I know these are all issues that we all care about deeply and, and know a lot about. I'd like to hear from one or two of you, what do you think is the biggest public misconception about election security or integrity? It's your chance to correct it. Well, I would say that um, two of them that emerged after the 2016 election, and I, I agree with with uh, my colleague, Mr. Prates, that uh, 2000 was a watershed moment that led to the new equipment, and our big security concern after that event was trying to um, uh, undo the damage of undervotes and overvotes. And, uh, the swinging, hanging, pregnant jabs, all the things your mother worried about, you know, kind of hanging, swinging, and pregnant. And being able to determine the voters' intent. You know, that was what that transition was all about. And now we've, we've, we're trying to embrace uh, all kinds of different uh, real threats. Um, but there are also some uh, bogus threats that are circulating, that are being perceived as real. One of them is double voting, one of them is non-citizen voting. We can provide anybody who wants it a list of every single person who cast a ballot. Um, and if you know of, of these millions of non-citizens who allegedly voted, we, we'd be the first to take action, and we'd love for you to identify those. So uh, we've seen that. Those are the two biggest items that I think are the mis public misconceptions about uh, election security and integrity. Thank you so much, Jim. Does anyone else want to chime in? Does that sound similar to what other election administrators have heard or would like to correct today? Well, you know, I'll, I'll just tag on. Um, so I've had the, the sort of fortune of traveling uh, recently, working with um, Homeland Security, uh, the FBI, um, and a lot of my colleagues from around the country. You know, Jay Johnson last uh, January deemed um, elections as critical infrastructure. And with that, it set up a whole spiraling set of events, um, one of which was a requirement that, that we come together as a community of administrators and form what's called the Government Coordinating Council. 
And that council has been uh, sort of spinning up for the last uh, six months and just kicked off last week. And on this are secretaries of state and uh, state election directors and local election officials, with the Home Department of Homeland Security, EAC. And, and through that process, um, as well as participating in, uh, as a board member of the International Association of Government Officials and as the kind of cyber panel um, co-chair with the Election Center, uh, Republican, Democrat, I know uh, hundreds of election officials around the country, and they are all very dedicated to making sure that we solve this problem and all the problems. One of the, one of the concerns I have is um, that there are real threats, and to handle them appropriately, we must do so with um, reason and sobriety. And one of the big challenges is um, a significant amount of hyperbole that exists in, uh, in our business. And whether that's from one far extreme or another, it makes the, the job of actually solving these problems uh, particularly difficult. So I would just challenge everybody in this room when they go back and think about their, their notions of what, what's occurring. Um, look inside for a little bit of grace. And I think if we start with the assumption, by and large, that, that most of us are dedicated to the idea of getting this right, um, no matter where we come from on the political spectrum, then you're going to set up an environment where we're able to share the information necessary uh, to do that. Thank you. Matt, could you talk a, a bit more just for a moment? You talked about things that aren't as large of problems as people may discuss in the public, and then at the same time there are some genuine issues and threats that do need to be addressed. So can you talk a little bit about what you see as the biggest challenge to ensuring secure, fair, and open elections? Sure. Um, well, I'll try and hit it from, from both sides, but, um, you know, fraud does occur, right? It, it's small, it's isolated, right? We want to attack it with a surgical instrument, and not a, a hammer. Um, but it is tough when you hear things like you've got a better chance of getting struck by lightning, right? Because half of our population just rolls their eyes at that that's not conducive to us getting to a place where we can convince them that it's small, it's rare, and it can be attacked with a surgical instrument and not a hammer. So, you know, it's important that I think we're, we're sort of honest about things on that side. Uh, on the other side, um, you know, there are absolutely impacts of restrictive voter ID laws. The idea that everybody carries one is simply false. And the idea that it is required to ensure um, election integrity is absolutely false. And so, you know, both sides need to sort of be honest about the level of the problem and the surgical uh, tools available to, to cut it out. If we do that, we create an environment in which we can work together, pass sensible things like ABR, which really can get to the heart of, um, you know, our voter registration list problems get together and do things like Eric, which really can get to the heart of our registration problems. You know, Eric is a vastly superior uh, tool to, to cross-check, right? So, I know cross-checks in the news a lot lately. We're in Eric, that's great. We need to get all those states around us to get into Eric. Indiana, Kentucky, Missouri, Iowa, right? All voter ID states proclaiming concerns about the voter registration rolls, yet not in Eric, right? So there are tools available, effective tools, that we can use to get to the heart of our problems. Um, I would just encourage us to spend some of our times with our friends, our colleagues in those states, and get them to join the tool that really works. Can you briefly say what Eric is for those who oh, don't know, I'm sorry. and then we'll turn it over to another panelist. Yeah, Eric is the Electronic Registration Information Center. It's a group of states, I think there are 21 of us now, where we share a bunch of information. We share our uh, motor vehicles list, our voter registration list, and in Illinois, a lot of our, um, uh, our licensing and uh, health agencies also share their list. We put it all in a mixer, use a really good matching algorithm, and then they tell us, hey, you know, these 10,000 people have registered to vote in another state, right? And we've got a four-point data match on them, not these two-point data matches that you might get from cross-check, okay? They'll also tell you, these 10,000 people live in your town right now, and they're not registered. You need to reach out to them and try and get it registered, okay? 
Um, it's, it's very secure. There are not uh, you know, data privacy issues because of, the, um, because of the way they do business. I mean, it was built by Pew and IBM, right? And then handed off to the states to run. So uh, does that give enough background on Thank you, on that's, that's great. Can someone else chime in about a challenge to ensuring the security and the accuracy and fairness of our voter systems? I kind of like to tag in with Noah's stuff, but in, in our area, we still get the the people and the voters that don't think that their vote counts. We'll hear that a hundred thousand times in our office. We're out doing a public outreach. That our, why should I go to election day if my vote doesn't count? I'm just one of these. No one cares. Da, da, da. The whole the litany of excuses and things of why they think that their vote doesn't count. And that misconception, I think keep some people from taking that, making that effort to go out and, and get their votes counted. We have elections, our, my jurisdiction is a fairly small Midwestern jurisdiction. And even in these last few elections, we have had municipal elections that were complete and total ties after all the ballots were counted, absentees, everything was done, complete and total ties. So these elected officials were decided by the fold of a coin, the elected to draw, we drew ping pong balls out of a number of ping pong balls out of a ping pong ball cage to determine who was going to represent these communities on their governing bodies. That kind of crazy. That we shouldn't have to decide who's going to lead our people in and make decisions for these communities by the choice and luck of the draw of a ping pong ball. So we strongly encourage and try to get out on the front side of the public relations aspect to make sure that voters know that. Your vote counts, even if you don't think it counts, even if you're just one vote, and you're the only one that votes against that object, that, that topic, or votes for that particular candidate, that vote still is important, that vote still counts. That's such a great reminder. I know you mentioned you may want to, you may want to weigh in also about voter registration databases. Did you have anything else you wanted to Okay, great. Can anyone speak to what you see as the main threats for hacking or for insecurity of our voter information, especially as we get closer and closer to the 2018 primary elections? Sure. Um, I think um, the hacking threats are, are real. I saw, uh, I think many of you saw um, some of the expo at DEF CON, uh, which is a basically a hackers convention in Las Vegas, where they picked various pieces of equipment apart and uh, were able to manipulate items. Now, you know, some of the, the defense that was thrown up immediately was that, well, a lot of these systems aren't in use anymore, this and that. But they, they point out the, the vulnerabilities in the systems. But I do want to point out that there is one security that we do have, uh, at least in Illinois, uh, and one that um, experts, uh, that would greater minds than mine, and that's paper. Uh, paper is a, a wonderful, wonderful safety net um, protection. Um, Illinois, all systems are required to have a paper trail for every single ballot cast. Uh, there are other states that uh, it's hard to believe don't. Uh, if something happens to that piece of voting equipment, I don't know what you do to recover those votes. It's a, it's a nightmare scenario. Um, but I've given to Sarah with uh, the Illinois campaign some information. Uh, there's a, a great video uh, from one of the best minds in computer se security and uh, especially encryption. His name is uh, Professor Ron Rivest. In fact, he's one of the developers of the predominant uh, systems of encryption. And he speaks at length in this video that I shared with uh, Sarah who tweeted out um, uh, about uh, the virtues of paper and the value of paper and the threats that we, we face uh, with the prospect of internet voting, which he calls an absolute nightmare. Um, and, that, and, and even though the video is from 2012, I've checked with him recently if, his, if all of his points are still, if he holds those true, and he said, yes, absolutely. Um, I think some of the bigger hacks that we're seeing are, are in our entire voting ecosystem. And it's, it's troubling when you have big money and dark money and essentially secretive money, um, foreign sources can now uh, easily uh, manipulate our public, our voters. Um, it's happening not only in the United States, but also Germany. We saw it in Great Britain. 
We've seen it recently in Catalonia, where uh, Kremlin propaganda basically gets spread by uh, unsuspecting people uh, as if it were real news. Uh, and, and real manipulation is occurring. We're seeing, uh, uh, we need uh, a better uh, system somehow uh, of regulating that money that goes to uh, these viral systems like, like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but we also need some kind of trusted person, a, a Walter Cronkite of sorts, right. who can tell us that these sources of news are legit and they're trying their best to get it right. Uh, I think those are some of the things that are, are even bigger threats than anything we can talk about with, uh, with voting systems because we have divergent sets of facts and you can't have different sets of facts. It's just impossible. But, uh, that's one of the things that I find trouble right now. I'm wondering, Bernadette, if you or Colin have thoughts either about the threats of hacking or the broad definition of hacking that Jim gave or other challenges to our voting systems. Yeah, I think that with the hacking threats that are out there now, one of the big challenges in general is defining what hacking is. It's all different types of things and it's coming at all different levels of government. So a big thing that I think we need to do across governmental levels is communicate. I think that different states who have experienced different situations need to communicate with us. Different levels within a state need to communicate. The federal government needs to help aid in communication because once you have that sort of data sharing, I think it can start maybe pinpointing the credible threats in a way that we as the, the administrators of elections can then target those threats. And then once we know what to target, I do think that uh, funding is a big issue. I think that a lot of the, the funding necessary to really uh, attack the threats at the source is something that we need. The majority of the money for elections is actually spent at the local and county level. So I think that direct funding at those levels too would help in the future to counteract these types of threats. Yeah, and just going back to Jim's point about hacking, I think um, paper in terms of actual when actual election day, I'm worried that my vote isn't counting because it's being hacked away. I think the best single thing that we can do to um, allay some of those concerns is to have a paper trail. Now, that's not to say that it's the end-all be-all of that, but it's very important and. Um, it's one of the reasons our systems here in Illinois are more resilient than um, other completely um, electronic um, voting machines. Um, but then the other side of hacking that I don't think um, I heard brought up or really talked about is hacking in terms of voter information. And while uh, the voter information that uh, we have doesn't necessarily contain um, say social security numbers, it's still incredibly valuable and we saw just last summer that um, the State Board of Elections was hacked and millions of voter registration um, files were um, compromised and that information is important not just for uh, the integrity of ballots but it's also valuable information for people who are potentially interested in swing individual jurisdictions or precincts because if you know who has voted and you know uh, you know the makeup of the, the the jurisdictions and I mean the more information you have the more ability you are to um, have these social social hacking or social targeting schemes that um, are are prevalent in the news and we're um, we're finding out more and more prevalent in the 2016 elections. So one thing that comes to mind here in Colin's remarks is that there are ways that the public is concerned about the security and privacy of our voter information in addition to being worried about hacking. Also there have been renewed concerns about our information because of the activities of the Pence Kobach Voter Fraud Commission as well as the recent local and state discussions about our information being in the cross-check system. Bernadette, if you can please speak to 
uh, from the, how the State Board of Elections has handled these concerns and what is it that we all should know about those types of threats to our information. Okay, um, specifically for the, the COVAC Commission request, I'll just give a brief timeline. Uh, the board did receive an initial request for Illinois voter data, and at that time the commission indicated that the information gathered would be made public. Therefore, the board denied that request. Per state statute, electronic voter data maintained by the board is not accessible to the public. It's only accessible to political committees for a bona fide political purpose and also to governmental entities for governmental purposes. So the board then received a second request in July. And in this request, it was indicated that the commission would keep the voter data confidential and secure, and that the data would be destroyed once the commission had completed its work. Um, the board considered that request, but sent a response back to the commission, indicating that a clear governmental purpose is necessary for the data to be released and also requesting payment of $500, that's the standard payment <laughs> that's requested of anybody who wants the statewide voter database. So, and, and in our response, we also noted that the Attorney General's office had contacted us with concerns that even though our FOIA laws exempt voter data from being released, the federal FOIA laws may not, as well as um, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, so we expressed those concerns from the Attorney General Office in our response and requested further documentation to support the Commission's uh, assertion that they're going to keep the data confidential. And to this date, we have yet to receive a response from the Commission. For a check. For a check. <laughs> We've been hearing reports as recently as this morning about it being unclear what the status of the Commission is right now, the Federal Commission, in terms of its activities or its momentum and the I believe that the federal GAO has announced that they will be investigating the commission if any panelists have more updates or insights into that I welcome you to share it as well well as many of you already know that uh, the head of the commission has been uh, sanctioned to put it mildly by the courts for um, providing bad information um, we know uh, we can be informed from his history and in um, serving as the Secretary of State of Kansas, that uh, we, we know one of his goals nationwide is to try to um, require people to provide proof of citizenship at time of registration. Um, he has fought as Secretary of State to become the only Secretary of State with prosecutorial powers. Mm -hmm. And since gaining those, he's found one case of voter fraud that he was able to prosecute. Um, but he's, he's attempted to do this with the National Voter Registration Act, commonly known as the Motor Voter uh, Act, the form, and uh, he managed to get that through uh, the EAC to get a modification to his state's form. So uh, we know from his past where he's going with this. And uh, I, I find it pretty galling uh, in the case of uh, my recently deceased father, the notion that I would try to have to find, a, when he went into nursing home, that I would have to find a birth certificate for a Korean War veteran to make sure that he could vote after he moved from his home to his nursing home. I just, I just find some of these things um, beneath our country. Uh, the, all the advocates for voter ID tend to be the same people who also cite the founding fathers, and I wonder what kind of photographic ID they had in uh, 1782, so. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that story and story from your family. It really helps to hear that context, and one thing I'm thinking about that Noah had mentioned is that it's important to be fact-based in what we we're discussing, and when we're resisting or responding, it's important to have facts in mind. I know I was moved by State Board of Elections data published recently about what is the incidence of fraud. I don't know if Bernadette you have that handy or if others want to talk about the, the facts that we do have relating to the obviously very low incidence of voter fraud in Illinois. I remember seeing something in a State Board publication about 
thousandths of a percent being at issue, uh, thousands of a percent of votes being at issue. Yeah, basically that's correct. It, it's a very minimal amount and that a lot of the, the concerns that people relate to double voting um, on paper, it, it may look that way, but when you really delve deep down into it, uh, it might just be a situation where there's a father-son and, and they live at the same house and they go to vote on election day and maybe somebody gets marked down as under the wrong signature when you sign in. So it, the actual incident of double voting and voter fraud like that, that is actually reported and then prosecuted is very low within the state. Moving to a different topic, and again, getting closer to home focusing on Illinois, we heard a lot of questions to our voter protection hotline and, and generally in news reports, questions and concerns that voters have about voting machines and reports that some of the machines are very outdated and I know there's also been some activity on the front of local election boards to try to address that. So please share with us updates that voters should know uh, about a certain local area or across the state relating to the how current our voting machines are. Sure. Um, so we got all that money in uh, 2002 or three. Um, three billion dollars were um, was in the bill, HABA, and they've allocated something like 2.6 uh, billion of that. But that's all been spent long ago, except for in LA, um, and they're still voting on an old on an old system. But anyway, we, we upgraded in 2005, and we're ready again. We're actually in the process of, of procuring new equipment, um, and it's a fortuitous time to be doing it. Not only because we can no longer sustain the old equipment as we can part, you know, take pieces out from old ones. I mean, we can hold it together for a few more years. But in this new threat environment, right, with Russians and North Koreans, Iranians, Chinese, uh, advanced persistent threats poking away at all of our networks, um, you know, defend, detect, recover is important. And so defense is very important because you want to make it hard to do. But everybody who's tried has appeared to have failed to fully defend their systems. That's just the nature of cyber and the threat actors. I mean, look at Equifax recently. Their only job is to protect your PII, right? Credit history, and, and they failed. And they failed for a long time without knowing it. So what's critical after that is detect that they've been there and recover. And so this was mentioned earlier, and we always start at the end too. Recovery, resiliency, that's what's most important. So Illinois took a leading edge posture on this after HABA by requiring, I know David Orr uh, pressed hard, and Mike Madigan agreed to make sure that we have voter verifiable paper trails on the touch screens, right? Now, that's, that's not perfect. I mean, probably best is to have a piece of paper, but it's better than not having a piece of paper. So resiliency is key, right? Being able to stand back up after you've been taken down. But to get there, you've got to detect they were inside in the first place, right? You've got to detect what's going on. So the new crop of voting equipment that's out there and available really aids in that effort, all right? So um, what we've asked for in our procurement process is, is a similar system to what we've had. Uh, most folks will get an optical scan ballot and vote it and throw it through a scanner. A lot of folks uh, on those in early voting will likely be voting on a touch screen machine. Uh, but instead of a, a spooling a voter verifiable paper trail, which we hope everybody uses and know some don't, instead of using that, um, an actual paper ballot will be spit out to them showing their choices. That'll go through the same scanner. These scanners take PDF images of the ballots. Right? Um, some of them in the market actually sort of randomly bait stamp them. So you can always tie the cast vote record to the PDF image, you know, to the piece of paper. It makes the ability to audit, uh, potentially to publish, to really verify that the equipment is doing what you say it's doing, what you believe it's doing. It, you know, your ability to prove that up uh, is greatly increased with the new technology. Um, and so, I don't know who's going to be our partner in this, but we're very excited about the, the new possibilities. One, we think it's going to be a better voter service, but from the ability to detect whether or not anything untoward's happened in the system, right? And you know, 
the world we're in with the new threat actors, that, that, that it's possible. The 17 intelligence agencies uh, tell us it's possible. They say the threat is there. Threat is capability and intent. Those four countries I named absolutely have it. They're probably sort of potheads in basements all over this country that are poking around and have it. They've gotten into other systems. Why not ours? So we're excited about our ability to stand up a much more um, resilient, right, be able to recover, be able to detect, and be able to defend. And what about the, what is the statewide picture like? I'm wondering if Clerk Scott Erickson or others want to weigh in about how current our voting machines are. And I, I want to clarify too, that when we get calls or reports from voters over the phone or in person, sometimes they are about the types of issues that Noah described, and sometimes they are a lot more basic, for lack of a better term. And voters tell us, for example, I tried to submit my ballot, and there seemed to be an issue with the machine that scans the ballot, and then I had to keep my ballot on the side, uh, and the election judge said they would take care of it later, and it made people feel uncomfortable, and they asked us, is this normal? Is this suspicious? Should I not go to the polls anymore? Sometimes it's those types of questions that we receive as well at a more basic level. Absolutely. Um, we all as election officials deal with our, their equipment and equipment issues and with anything technology-wise, things are going to have issues and break. Uh, with Optimacy and the paper ballots, they're all reading those ovals or the arrows that you filled in through an optic lens. Things happen if the machines aren't properly maintained, um, kept current. The, the optical scanner sees an item on air, it will reject that ballot back when there truly may not be an error there. The, uh, the, the rejection piece of that uh, equipment is a voter safety piece to make sure that they're trying to keep from oh, having their votes spoiled because they accidentally voted for two races when they should have voted, two candidates when they should have voted for one candidate. So a lot of times those issues uh, pop up. We transport our machines to our polling locations. As you transport the equipment, it gets jostled. Everything's in our, in our jurisdictions are tested to make sure that everything is safe and accurate before we leave our, our control. Once they go to the polling places, climate can be different. It could be if it's a very cold uh, March primary day, the machines could be very, very cold. You touch on the electronic touchscreen machines, it could take them a few minutes to warm themselves up, just like you left your computer out in the car all night long. That laptops can take a while to get everything going. And we field questions and calls of that as well. Uh, the judges' uh, training that we give to our election officials in the field is their set protocols of how they handle situations and circumstances. If that ballot is rejected back, how do you handle that to make sure that the voter uh, ballot privacy is secure? We have paper covers that can go over those ballots to that the judges can place over that ballot. Make sure that the votes are safe the judge can find out what the issue is. The machine usually tell them it's an overvote, it was an undervote, it was whatever the issue was. They can try to address that and that ballot secrecy is still safe and secure. Usually when those incidents happen, we do get phone calls in the office as well. Hey, this happened, the ballot kicked back. What, do, what was I supposed to do? Did my ballot actually count? And we can tell you, yes, it did count. There's just the safety features that are placed into that. And um, my jurisdiction is one that really has embraced the electronic voting. Um, our electronic touchscreen machines have gone over very, very well. Um, the voter verified by the paper trail is the, the, the linchpin of that whole operation. If that piece wasn't in place, there's no way that I'd feel comfortable placing those machines out in an election. Being able to rebuild an election if something went completely catastrophic and we lost everything, we'd still be able to rebuild that election with the paper ballots that went through our optical scan machines and the ver voter verifiable verify paper trail for our touchscreen devices. It would take us a while to rebuild, but we still have the ability to rebuild that election and, and feel confident that those results are accurate and secure. Voters ask questions, especially when the equipment first came out. What's this? They wanted to take the paper out of the verifiable paper trail. I want my receipt. We don't have this. This is how it works. Once they understood the process and the protocols of it, they grasped the concept. They liked it a lot. Um, all elderly population seemed to be a little more resistant to it. So we would take the time to walk them through if they were in for an early voting. We'd walk them through the process. Here's what you're going to experience. Here's how you go. And we're only, a, we're only 50 feet away from you. If you've got a problem, holler, we can help you. And I had an election judge that was, was an elderly lady. 
wanted to vote. I'm going to try that new that newfangled touchscreen machine you got there. Okay. She didn't want me to get more than five feet away from her while she was voting her ballot. I'm, I'm covering my eyes and doing everything I can to stay away from her while she's voting to make sure that she still feels comfortable and I'm still not jeopardizing her ballot secrecy. Finishes that ballot, her ballot card pops out, she comes back to me and I'm waiting for her. I'm waiting for her to yell and scream at me that this newfangled stuff is nothing but garbage. She takes a deep breath, looks at me and goes, that wasn't that. <laughs> That's a great story. And you talked a couple of times about the important role of election judges and poll workers in communicating this information to our community members and our voters. If, if you have a burning desire to mention something really quickly about the voting machines, please go for it. And then I'd like to change the topic to talking about election judges. Sure. Um, I think that both the clerk's office and, and our office are looking at new equipment because um, I would describe the status of our equipment as brittle but not broken. We've been through uh, the white hot test of, of recounts where you have to go through every single ballot. Uh, ironically, uh, Will Gazzardi was running against uh, Antoinette Ant Berrios. Um, lost the first time in the primary by 121 votes. We went through it and we found one more vote for him, one more vote for her, where the person had one person had underlined all the names instead of connecting the arrow. Another person had circled the names instead of connecting the little arrow. But the integrity of the system uh, ultimately shone through. And then two years later, the two same candidates ran against each other. It was close again. And he won. And uh, we went through a little bit of the recount process. And uh, you know the, the system has held up when it's put through uh, that hardest of tests. Um, but we, we want to get it right. Um, in truth, all election officials pray to get it right and pray for distance between number one and number two. We don't care who wins, but distance is great. When it's not there, we go to that paper trail and uh, we try to be uh, uh, fair arbiters. But going back to what uh, we want to pursue, uh, not just audits after the election, but something a little more precise and surgical. Um, such as risk limiting audits um, and the, the idea of the scanned image of every single ballot that would open the door to the possibility that we could publish and let everyone, if they wanted to, go through a 100% audit and look at the images and, and what the logic of the scanner did uh, on each and every ballot to see whether it determined properly <coughs> that this half marked oval uh, should have counted for which candidate, you know. So I was going to say it was good to hear about a smooth recount story. That that was a relief. And a, a couple of moments ago, we were talking about election judges, and I we only have a little bit of more time for this panel before we turn it over to audience questions. So I have to make sure to get one of my questions in that I know a lot of us care about. And we have a lot of people in the room who have served as election judges and performed that really important service. And we've heard about even people at this table being involved in that role before. These are people who are hard at work for so many hours on election day and beforehand as well, and often who are temporarily in, involved in our election systems, involved in it for a varying number of years and different types of trainings that they may have received, maybe depending on when they joined, when they came on board, where in the state they are. So it would be great to hear about, hear your thoughts from anyone who's interested about what you see as being really critical to that model working well and what aspects of election judge or poll worker management are the most important to successful elections. I'll just on uh, one point. You know, I made a comment earlier about uh, election administrators being sort of IT logistics specialists and um, and now information security specialists, but the truth is election judges are counselors and lawyers, and then after 2000, we asked them to be IT specialists and set up all this equipment, and it made it quite a burdensome job. And one of the things we're doing um, with our new equipment is, it's our intention to have all the equipment set up already inside of the PSC, and you just unlock it, press power, right? The touch screens are already hung up. Wow. The judges don't have to do anything. We can go back to focusing them on administering the election laws, um, and that's it, right? Uh, we built a poll book in a way that they don't have to look at an affidavit and decide whether they're box one through 17, 
right? All the sort of workflow and information is built right into that. So we can, we can work um, as a government or as agencies to make their jobs easier. But the crux of it is still, um, we've got 20% turnover between elections, right? That puts a pretty significant burden on, um, on retraining, right? And it puts giant holes in each precinct where you like continuity um, between uh, team members. Uh, you, you learn a lot by doing, you know, the trial by fire is way better than three hours of training for us. Um, so we hope that by making it simpler, uh, by increasing access to early voting, by, by, by doing policy decisions like vote by mail uh, for anybody who wants it, we're, we're decreasing the burden of the precinct in the hopes of um, sort of increasing the, the retention rate. So retention is really pretty key for us, um, and, and so those efforts are aimed at uh, a higher retention rate. So a question for Noah, or pe people who are looking at this from a statewide perspective, how can we ensure, whether it's through retention or what else can be in place, so that election administration can be improved to guard against eligible voters being incorrectly turned away from the polls, especially when we have tools now that people could theoretically register. I mean, it should not just be theoretical, it should be real that we could register on the spot if we're, if so we're eligible but not yet registered. So how do we kind of improve that in practice in terms of when election judges are interfacing with those situations, keeping in mind that we still hear story upon story, even in a great state like Illinois, of eligible voters being incorrectly turned away from the polls with the civil rights work we do. We definitely hear from uh, voters of color and so others who are turned away from the polls. Can I hit just uh, one, you know? Rescind the mic, but um, <laughs> from a policy perspective, we made the decision in Illinois um, to offer election day registration, and that should be the sort of failsafe that makes sure that never happens. Uh, and by the way, from a sort of national security protecting the election perspective, it's a huge win. We talked about resiliency. Okay, it's not just voting equipment that's a target. We've got a bunch of systems, right? Voter registration systems are one of them. Uh, the ability to, to seamlessly uh, process voters on election day, even with um, a, a sort of corruption from whatever the source of a, of a local voter registration database. With election day registration, you can conceivably do that. It's a very powerful policy decision that, that our lawmakers made. Um, but I think it should be extended to all the counties in the state. And right now, it's only the big counties. Now granted, 83% of the voters in Illinois can walk into their precinct and register on election day or correct an error. Um, the other 17% have to get sent to election headquarters. Now, there is a bit of a resource drain, but 80 plus counties right now can make the decision to only offer it in their, um, in their, in their election headquarters. And I think in terms of sort of building Illinois up as a, as a group, the entire ecosystem, I think that would be a major um, policy shift. Uh, and I, I, Scott, you may want to hit that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just spent a lot of money of yours. You did spend a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. And I am I'm fully uh, on board with making sure that everyone that's registered to vote gets that opportunity to vote. With the opportunities we've given them in the state with early voting, absentee voting, uh, all those opportunities, there shouldn't be a reason for you not to be able to get out and vote if you so choose to do that. And that's what we want to encourage people to do. My jurisdiction is a smaller jurisdiction that was not mandated to have that long in polling location on uh, same day registration. So our procedures are that if a voter uh, is at the polling location and there's an issue with the registration that can't be fixed at that immediate level, that they are then redirected back to our to the county clerk's office at the courthouse. Our county is a small enough size that they can get back to our office in, in, in fairly short time. Then my staff and myself make sure that we get them registered, that we will vote them in our office directly so that they're all taken care of, so they don't have to go back out into the polling location that they were supposed to be registered in, not have anything in the registration books for them, and get hassled by the election judges that you're not in our books, we can't handle this. So we take some of the problems of them coming back in and then going back out. We've kind of circumvented those issues by handling them in office. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it works for us. Um, huge thing about requiring those in polling place voter registration is our election judges, there's an additional piece of training you have to give to them. Our county and a lot of the counties uh, downstate don't have computer connectivity uh, to make sure that we're getting them precincted into the right location and sure in the proper ballots. We have to be able to have that connectivity back to our central database to make sure that we're getting them located properly. 
when I can't give voter um, information to them because there's no computer or internet access, even with a wire hotspot, we can't get connections. It deters the ability to have that, that same real-time operation. So it, it sounds great on paper, and I, I, I like the idea that we need to have that registration in the precinct. But unfortunately, the reality for a lot of our smaller downstate communities is it's, it's not effective. It's an unfortunately, it's cost prohibitive. We'd have to increase um, putting in voter poll books that we don't necessarily have in all of our jurisdictions. So there's a huge burden that'd be coming onto the taxpayers to supplement this. Now, if they decide that we can, there's a way we can find those funds to do that, and we can find a solution to the problem, that's great. But unfortunately, for the, the near time being, I, I see it's going to be a very hard hurdle to, to cross to be able to make that happen. So how do we then adapt with the requirements and be able to still make it work for our voters? So each election jurisdiction down downstate works to try to make it the best solution for their for their county. I don't think there's one cookie cutter solution for all of this, and not one solution is going to fit for everybody. What would work for me wouldn't necessarily work for Noel. He's got a, he's got ten times the voters registered voters that I have. What works for me may not work for one of our smaller smaller counties, even smaller than mine. They only may have three or four hundred registered voters. Um, the, the economy of scale is just it's crazy about how we go from small to, to large. So it's a huge issue to try to work with. But I know I can speak for all the other the election officials that. If they don't have the ability to do that in precinct, they are working hard to make sure that the burden is reduced as much as they can since those voters are eligible and taken care of. Thank you. We have a lot of exciting questions coming soon from the audience. And so at this time, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Chicago Board of Elections for hosting us today. I'll just give them a round of applause. They let us in to ask them all of our questions. Um, so I want to start with a question from our live stream, and this is from Susan Gallagher, and um, she had a question about election judges. So she said in her area, um, the shifts for election judges are the entire day, which she thinks would be easier to do a half day um, or a part of the day, and she just wondered why this choice is made and if you guys have thought about that. <laughs> so one is we're driven entirely by statute. Um, there's a point to having five judges and continuity uh, throughout the day to make choices to sign in the morning, that there were no votes to sign in the night, that they match up with the number of voters, uh, that you get an equal mix of um, Democrats and Republicans or, you know, three to two ideally. Um, so aside from that challenge, there's no question that the burden is biggest in the morning. Um, it would be uh, ideal in many ways to go from uh, five to three or, some, or something like that. It would certainly help with uh, retention. You know, we're considering things like um, uh, sweeping people in on a, in addition to the five just to help out in the morning with these half day shifts. We know it would help uh, people a lot. It's uh, certainly a great idea. Um, and I want to just encourage everyone to keep their questions. One part questions. Okay. And we're going to try to get through as many as we can. And then I'd encourage, our, I'd encourage our panelists to do one to two person answering the question just so we can um, get through it quickly. Just burst my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I have two. Um, and you one, can I was told, oh, like I'm sorry, better. Betty Magnus, Rainbow Push Coalition. I was told that we had cross checked in process before this new administration came out with their stupid letter and all that stuff. Uh, and that it was something that worked. My other question is uh, provisional. Ballots. People think that their vote does absolutely does not count if they do one. It does not appear that same day registration solves that problem because if I'm Betty Magnus and I've lived where I lived 27 years and I go to vote with no ID, uh, the only alternative if I'm not on the books is a provisional ballot because I don't have ID to register same day. I'll answer your part about the, pro the provisional ballot. Uh, you are correct. We were assuming that once the same day registration came through, that would dramatically reduce our uh, provisional malady. And it has had a dramatic effect on that. We're able to solve a lot of those issues um, and take care of those beforehand. We were normally run on, our, on a large election. In my jurisdiction, we may have 50 to 75 provisional ballots. It's, it's a small number compared to a lot of other jurisdictions. But we, we could have that. The last few elections have seen the reduction in those numbers. Um, 
but we always do when the voters come in and they're asking questions about those provisional ballots. We always encourage them to make sure that they provide us with the documentation that's needed, whatever information triggers that provisional ballot, to make sure that everything's followed up with. And we're always open with them to make sure that if they've got questions, we're always happy to answer that for them. So we try to make sure that they do feel that their, their votes do count. If for some reason it was a problem with them, to be able to reach back out to them and let them know, you know, your vote wasn't able to be processed because of this particular reason. But now we fixed the problem for you. We've registered you now. You're able to be taken care of. For the cross-check question, so the state of Illinois entered into cross-check in 2010. At that point in time, that was, it was the new data sharing agreement among states to share voter data. Um, since then, there's now the ERIC system. The ERIC system, it's a superior system in that it matches on more criteria. Therefore, you get an incident, a, a lower incidence of false positive matches. Um, the, the issue with some of the states with ERIC is that not everyone's in it yet. A lot of our neighboring states are not yet in it. So right now, we're still in the crop in cross check. We would encourage as many states as possible to enter into ERIC as we recently did. I think funding is holding some states back. And uh, from a board standpoint, the board is aware of a lot of the concerns with cross-check and they're considering all the information. And the board voted in 2010 to enter into cross-check. So at this point in time, in order to leave it, it would take a board vote. But they are aware of all the concerns with the program. I know it's Mary Jo Noonan, I'm Lyons Township Clerk, and I have my deputy clerk here. And also, I just paid my dues, you know, to the League of Women. <laughs> so we're all, we're all in this together. Right? And as you say, communication is the most important. Uh, Noah knows, David's always been responsive as uh, providing us with liaisons from the county. And we have the uh, yeah, I guess uh, the ear Mary, you know, of David and everyone. But getting back with the youth, Noah, and I hire youth in the township. They are the best. <laughs> and they are the ones who are always interested in voting. And the league goes out, drops off everything by the uh, township <coughs> for registration. So they've done an excellent job. You know, all the way around Hinsdale, the Lions Township, Nasworth, you know, all of our high schools. But you have to concentrate on the youth uh, to keep them inspired. I know they go off to college, you know, but with the uh, voting now at 17, and then, you know, they can vote by 18, you know, current. So what I'm getting at is split shifts was brought to my attention many years back. Right, and I see that you know you had gone out to the high schools and spoke with uh, you know the principal, the counselors, uh, back and forth. I believe you have to have that good communication and continue with it. And the split shift, maybe there is an adult that does not want to you know participate, but I think it can. If, you know, thank you. That. if I may, um, we love having. Uh, young poll workers, we lead the nation on that front in Chicago. We are very fortunate to be able to do that because we have an organization called Make the Challenge. They have a pipeline into all the high schools, so the, the younger poll workers tend to be more tech savvy. They, they're able to handle the situations more smoothly, uh, so we're with you there. Um, as far as split shifts, that, that would require a change in state law and quite honestly a lot of changes in systems. I mean, what happens if the second shift doesn't show up? I mean, it, it raises a lot more questions than it does answers. Kevin oh. um, Mordax, League of Women Voters. Um, I guess I have more of a suggestion than a question. Um, I'm interested in uh, getting uh, people who leave prison uh, re-registered to vote in Illinois. Uh, we're better than most states. Um, Frankly, though, um, most people in the state tend to think that we have the same rules as other states, that these people can never vote again and all kinds of things. Um, so I have a question, uh, a suggestion. One is, um, do we have to take them off the voter rolls? Um, clearly, can't we put a little marker next to them the same way that we do for 
people who uh, register online or register with the motor voter who have to vote in person the first time that they vote. Um, can't we just put a marker saying they cannot vote absentee and therefore they've never left uh, the, motor, the voter rolls at all because clearly they can't vote in person if they're in prison. Once you've moved to um, <coughs> penitentiary, we can't predict what your next move is gonna be. So the answer to your question is no. Uh, we can't like put them in a holding uh, area of a database and, <clears throat> and know what, where they're going to go after they've served their time. So uh, well, it's just a it's, it's, change of address is what we're talking about, though. That's no, while you're incarcerated, serving a prison term for a felony, you're not allowed to vote. Right, but I'm just saying, if there were a marker in the database saying they have to vote in person, that's the equivalent of not allowing them to vote. So this is not an answer to your question. It's not on behalf of election administrators, but I do want to mention that our organization and other civic organizations are active on the issue of putting our heads together of how do we improve voter access for people who have interfaced with the criminal justice system, past and present. And I do want to mention it's important to get input from the people who are most directly affected, which I know is logistically and socially challenging when some people are incarcerated, there's going to be limited access. but. There, believe it or not, there's a voting rights think tank in Stateville Prison. There are people even who can't vote right now, but who have really sharp policy ideas about how we could improve our systems going forward. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement on this end if we work closely with election officials who know the details of the systems and the feasibility of implementing these ideas. I want to turn it back to Sarah. Um, yeah, I have one from online from Bonnie Cox from the League, who many of you know and love. Um, she says there are online voter service websites like ballotready.org, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, um, <laughs> where voters may want to access in the ballot booth, um, but we've learned that some jurisdictions prohibit cell phone use in the voting booth. Can you talk about the tension there between trying to protect security versus um, providing that information? Specifically Erickson, I suppose, we want to hear from. Oh, shit. <laughs> if you don't mind. That was the bus to back up over me. No. <laughs> no, with the technological advances, we're, you're always able to take in a palm card or, or different things to be able to have. Remember those candidates you wanted to vote for, um, graduate political science degree, there's all the science behind the things, the last colors that you see on the campaign signs triggers a reminder that you're going to vote for that candidate. There's all kinds of theories and things that are out there that, that do that. Now with the modern technology, like Sarah said, there's the ability to put those hand and palm cards now in an electronic format. The also then the issue becomes then what happens if you take that ballot, your electronic uh, device in, use that to vote, and then you take a picture of your ballot. There's been discussion about it. you should allow them to take pictures of this. You know, what, what are the consequences of allowing voter pictures of, uh, of cast ballots or partially cast ballots? It adds a whole different dynamic to the situation. So a discussion about allowing candidate information to be able to be kept with that voter versus valid integrity is a discussion we need to have. Yeah, and I'd love to piggyback there. There's a split in the courts right now as to whether or not um, there's a kind of protection for people to take a picture of their ballots or whether, in fact, we want to maintain uh, integrity of voter secrecy. Um, uh, and prevent untoward influence um, by, by bosses um, or whatever. That's probably been a split on this table. Um, I know at the clerk's office, we're certainly very concerned with the idea of people taking pictures of a marked ballot. I mean, it's unnecessary, right? I think the Tribune said, it's like a digital um, I voted sticker. Well, actually, a picture of your I voted sticker is a digital I voted sticker. <laughs> this is a picture of your ballot, which could be sold. Right, more broad. Right. And so in our opinion, we, we don't think you should take a picture of your voter ballot. So. Hey, take a picture of a blank ballot. Point at your favorite candidate. Well, I was, Go just gonna ask, I was just gonna ask, if, please provide some clarification and hope for people who like to document the exciting occasion somehow, <laughs> that may not be the best way. And so if, if you can share a little bit about what is allowed, I know I've heard that from Jim before when people ask about selfies and Let's, let's provide some ideas about alternatives instead of pictures of the completed ballots. Yeah, just not your voter ballot. Anything else? That's my line. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we don't want to 
do anything to dampen anybody's enthusiasm. If they're that enthusiastic about participating, we certainly want them to take photos, but not of their voted ballot, um, because it does open the door to coercion or selling it. Um, so it's it's one of those things that the, some of the courts have ruled that we can't prohibit it yet, uh, because uh, you almost have to prove that there's something bad going on, and then that they're not doing it just to you know smile next to a, a voted ballot, but um, like. Like no one said, we're getting mixed reviews from, uh, on this question from the course. Uh, Frank Hansen, I'm a volunteer with uh, Proviso 209 together. I got um, a question for Eric about, uh, about Eric actually. Um, the, uh, I think no one mentioned that um, you can get lists of people who are not yet registered. So can community groups get that so we can more effectively do uh, voter registration? Second question, I know I'm also, only supposed to do one. Uh, what about open source voting software? Uh, is that going to be well, something? On Eric's, uh, no, it's, 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 it's direct, it's protected, and that outreach is actually driven at the, the state level to start off, and it will be um, driven locally, but it's not supposed to be shared for a variety of sort of um, charter reasons, uh, different states have different concerns. So that's Eric. Um, with respect to open source, we certainly wrote our RFP in a way um, that would, that anybody could have come in with an open source system. There is some value uh, to open source. Uh, nobody responded with an open source system, but there's some exciting things going on in uh, California and elsewhere, and there's certain place for open source and some of the ancillary systems. We're not just a voting system, we're not just voter registration. You know, we've got a number of election systems. We've got a very broad kind of threat surface area. Open source is pretty powerful. And, um, you know, I'll be watching for the next 15 years as voting systems come online. Uh, and maybe at the next generation for us, there'll be something that's ac actually marketable. And it's important to remember, too, that there are non-governmental sources of information for civic organizations that want to improve voter participation. And so there are other lists available when we want to target our activities of how to encourage more people in our community to vote. Hi, Carol Maher, a proud Chicago Board of Elections election judge and election coordinator, several elections. Um, are those new machines going to be faster? I work early voting, and the only reason they're in line is because those gosh darn machines are so slow because you can't skip over any particular race. So if they could be faster, it would be the bomb. <laughs> well, um, it was about nine years ago I had a funny experience. We had a church group coming in and they were all excited about the 2008 primary and they were excited about one candidate in particular. And uh, this woman calls me over to her machine so I stand on the opposite side of the machine so I can't see how she's voting. And she says, I'm done. And I said, well, you have to hit next. <laughs> and she had already cast her ballot for this one particular candidate that she was very enthusiastic about. And she says, no, I am done. <laughs> so I had to coach her through hitting next, 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 next. And then it had to give her a review. Mm -hmm. And then it had to give her a paper review. Oh, yeah. And that's the official record. Um, so she didn't have a whole lot of, but the, the fact of the matter is we have to provide a review, a safeguard, so that you can go back and correct any mistakes first on the screen and then the paper record and you still can go back and make any corrections. So that's what we're with right now. It's, it was intended to make sure that we captured the voters' intent. So Is that the aspect of the slowness that you were talking about? Yeah. Is the next generation going to address that? It's not a technology question. It's a ballot length. Of the length of our ballot. We, no. We're stuck with 80 retention judges in the fall and, and probably 80 candidates for judges in the spring. Right. And it's, it's one of the longest ballots in the country. It's not that way in Knox County because they don't have all the circuit judges that we do, but it's that way in Cook and Chicago. So that's what we're stuck with, is that length of that ballot. There's, so I, think I don't have an easy answer for that. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if you were talking about e-poll books or other aspects of No, I'm talking about 
Um, excuse me, wow. <coughs> Josh Wagner was Chicago land operator. So I grew up in a small rural county. I uh, lived in Springfield for a while, now live in Will County. It's never taken me more than five minutes to vote. I mean, in the door and out the door. But I remember in 2014, I think it was, all these widespread reports of people in the, in the urban areas having to wait two and three hours to vote. I had a coworker who told me she had to wait two hours to vote early, a couple weeks before the election. And I guess this is a widespread issue and I know there's I mean like 101 problems we're talking about here and it's overwhelming but I mean how could that how did that happen and is that is that going to continue happening because that could just distort the democratic outcome terribly to think because people can't wait three hours to vote I mean that's mm -hmm. we got to we got to do something so I just in 2014 that was our first rollout um, in Chicago with the uh, uh, election day registration so it was limited to uh, one site in particular out of the five that we offered um, that you know, the, they never called for the cavalry. We would have sent the cavalry. We didn't even know until um, you know hours after uh, this was going on that they still had this long line at one in the morning. Here we thought everything was shut down. We sent out the cavalry to one site. We got them finished at 11 o'clock at night. But that was our first time with election day registration last year, and that was with 5,000 people using election day registration in the last year in the. Uh, the election, the general election, the primary, we let the state with 30,000 people. It went without a hiccup. There weren't any uh, exceptionally long lines. Early voting, that's a, a function of what, uh, what kind of space we can get. And we're under scrutiny at a different level with the Justice Department on accessible sites. So some of the, the larger sites that we have, we're not even going to be allowed to use anymore uh, unless there's some kind of modification to the building or the, the, the entryway. So uh, there are a number of issues. Um, that we have to confront. We opened a super site downtown and we tried to encourage people to use having 150 pieces of equipment at an old Walgreens. And people were in and out even on the Monday before election day. Chance the Rapper led a group through a, 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 a parade of people and we got the last one in the door without incident at 7.20 p.m. even though the line had wrapped all the way around three city blocks. Uh, I mean, it was there with me that night. So, I wish that people would have left Belmont Library, taken a, a train downtown, and it would have been faster than waiting in that two-hour line. But early voting had two-hour lines this past election. I know. Yeah. It, 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 there, it, it's a limit to the size of the rooms that we have. Yes, it is. And so we can put more machines out there. We can't put more machines than the room will fit. Otherwise, you're, you're violating the privacy of the voter. So right. we're limited on some of these spaces. I just want to, in the suburban cook, um, those lines can flare up every now and then in early voting. Broad base absolutely don't exist. In fact, on our website, we publish a, a line length. So in our poll books, we built a, um, a little tool that captures the number of people in, in line, a little algorithm as uh, um, the actual processing number of people processed per minute. And we're uh, every 10 minutes updating wait times for all 53 of our sites. So we continue to um, expand uh, no lines like that. And it would be amazing if that kind of tool were in, in more places. And I think that kind of tool, along with the real-time community input about what the lines are like, can be very Sure, and we captured line data uh, in the precinct, and nothing spiked over 10 in, in November, so. Um, yeah, in the recent uh, Senate hearing, um, Alex Halderman from Michigan talked about all of the um, real vulnerabilities to our election machinery. And I know that the counties across Illinois got their money from HAVA and probably got uh, machines, you know, around 20, 2004, 2005. So they're all in need of replacement. Um, how many counties in Illinois are replacing their machines, like Illinois is and uh, the Chicago Board of Elections? And um, is there any help from the state to do this? Because we know that the federal money has dried up. Uh, I, I can speak for my jurisdiction. We do not have the resources to be able to replace our equipment. Now, like, uh, I, I like the brittle but not broke. I like that uh, um, philosophy piece. It, it, the machines are showing age. Uh, there is uh, concern to be watching. We'll have to look at that in the near future. But the financial status of our county and the lack of funds to be able to 
produce those uh, new machines and to get access to those machines is, is going to be very restrictive. And a lot of the smaller counties are in the same boat as, as we are. Um, the plus side, I guess if there is a plus side to that, is that as a smaller jurisdiction, the volume that's gone through those machines isn't quite as heavy as it is in the, in the more populous areas. So the, the, the lifespan can get, we can stretch that lifespan out a little bit longer. But the technology is still aging and is, I mean, your computer three years ago is now way out of date. And now we're looking at that 10 plus years that these machines have been there. So there is, there is issues to, to deal with. Do you with. think that's true for most counties in Illinois? Uh, I, I think the majority, I mean, I, uh, the majority of those uh, counties are probably not in a financial position to be able to look at getting new equipment. We're, we're not sure that we are. Yeah. We're going through the RFP process, and right now there are questions as to whether or not we're going to be able to secure the funding or how soon if we are going to. So, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. There's also, they can be certified in the state of Illinois, there's a testing protocols that have to be put in place. So even if we did have funds available, sometimes the newest technology things take a while to get certified and the process. So you could be running into issues with that as well. And that's a, um, you know, and I know that's an important thing to, to you and your group. Um, you know, we're putting forward a risk limiting audit bill, and it, that's a very good way of detection, uh, although it's a little obtuse um, to, to describe to folks, but what we do have right now um, is, a, is a set of audits. One that's really powerful, and that's the discovery recount, or an actual recount. We've gone through 15, um, and there you have interested parties, campaigns, looking at, with their eyes, hash marking, um, their single contest, including a gubernatorial contest in the Republican uh, primary years ago that was 106 votes. Um, looking down to the individual contest level, interested parties, making hashes, uh, and nothing's gone to court, nothing's been overturned. So there are a couple tools there um, that, that are effective in uh, testing where we're at. You know, we've got a 5% retabulation. Now that's not a very good um, kind of audit because what it was designed to do was to tell you if the equipment was acting as um, consistently, right? But if it's consistently wrong, then what are you testing? Um, but to the extent you dig in on the, on the 5%, you know, you get a real good sense of of accuracy, um, if not precision, because it's a, it's a tool that's really a hammer and, and not a, um, sort of not a scalpel. So, in any event, yeah, there are some things that, that I think we can do to increase the level of um, detection in the community, even if we can't boost defenses broad base. And so the risk limiting audit effort, I think, will be a good one. Okay, last question, I just have a minute. Yes, hi, Amber Ladera, Forest Park. Can we have confidence in the companies Diebold and Sequoia, remember a few years ago how bad things were? And I understand as of last fall, they're still producing these machines. So are we still using these machines and, you know, how good are they? Well, neither one is actually around anymore, um, which is fine, though. I mean, some of their equipment is and some of their people are, so it's still a fair question. Um, people uh, and Sequoia were both sold to uh, Dominion. Um, and, and so ultimately what we have to do is, um, at the end of the day, you come back to the idea of recovery, right, and detection. Um, we strive really hard through pre-election testing uh, to ensure that we're programming these things and they're going out. On the back end, um, if we're testing uh, them, that the machines counted as CAS by, by looking at actual ballots, um, then our burden of perfect defense with old equipment is way less. Um, so we're lucky in Illinois, 80% of the country still votes uh, on touch screens without paper. And if we should train our IR anywhere, it's there. Because it matters to voters in Cook County whether or not an election in Georgia is accurate or kind of, right? So, thanks. Yes, that, bear, that photo rear Bible paper trail to the canisters for those touch screen machines were such a benefit to us, like I said before, if we didn't have that piece in place, I, I, I love technology, I embrace technology, and I would have concerns that we would not, in a, in, a, in a worst case, doomsday scenario, we would not be able to rebuild that election. But with the systems that are in place now, we have the ability to rebuild that. Not that I would wish that on any, any of my friends or enemies, but the situation, the capability is there to be able to rebuild it. So with the testing, 
with the paper trails and everything, and with the voters being made educational wise to make sure that they're checking, make sure that what shows on the screen is showing what's on the paper verifiable trail, that we encourage them to do that. That all are pieces of the fail safe that are built in to, to make the system work with what we have. So the paper audit trail is supposed to last for a few years after the election to be sure that it's durable and everything like that. And I recently came across one you can still read every ballot cast on it, every signature of every judge from 2008. So if anybody wants to test this, dunk it in water, see if it comes out or whatever. I've even got water here, but uh, this uh, was an interesting find recently. So. And I would just like to say from ICPR's perspective, these questions are incredibly important to be asking your election administrators. And so uh, not only the accuracy and the integrity of the actual balloting is important, but also voter confidence uh, is important because that's what gets people out to the polls ultimately, is feeling like the people working there, feeling like the machines is are going to accurately represent their opinions and their votes. And so um, we would encourage voters to get in contact with their own, with your election administrators, respectfully send in letters, calls. They're very busy people as someone who is calling an election administrator basically every day at work. So I would encourage you to be patient with your election administrators and I'm sure they would all appreciate that as well. Um, and if you do have any questions or problems or feel like something's wrong, I would encourage you to, to talk with your local League of Women Voters, talk to ICPR, talk to uh, the Chicago Lawyers uh, Committee, um, because if there are issues and you don't feel confident in, uh, in your elections, we want to make sure that your vote's being counted and there are organizations out there that uh, want to make sure that the elections as a whole are worthy of, vote, of voter confidence, and we work with um, both voters and election administrators to make sure that happens. I couldn't agree more with what Colin said, and I'll just end on the note of that that communication is really key between election officials and voters, and one very concrete opportunity for all of us as community members and voters to give input is actually relating to the newly passed law of automatic voter registration, and the State Board of Elections is holding a hearing on that topic to get community input on the morning of November 20th. And people should see Bernadette if they have any questions about how to participate in that. Thank you everyone for a great discussion today. Thank you.